thousand. Wow. Yeah. Like this. I the minarets. Minara. The minarets. Yeah, yeah Cairo was well known of this like a long time ago. Okay. The city of one thousand. So don't now. What's this Hodge thing? Oh, so so that's another thing. So it's it's, it's five five things. I, I, I don't I don't know if I remember them, but uh, faith, uh, prayer, um, Hajj, which you have to do one time a day, uh, one time a year, one time in your life. Fasting Ramadan. <laughs> and fasting Ramadan. And What's Ramadan? Ramadan is um, the month that uh, Quran was uh, was was revealed. Was revealed, and it's um, an important month for us to uh, basically mm -hmm. like kind of renew your renewal of yeah, faith, like Christmas. We, yeah, and we do that uh, by fasting. But no presents. I uh, will in instead of presents, that, you don't eat. We don't eat, but then after that, there's eat, which is a celebration. After you don't eat, then you eat. Yeah. And then it's at sunset. Yeah. Uh, at sunset, yes. You at break, the sunset prayer. You break fast after the sunset prayer yes. during the month of Ramadan. And Ramadan is 35 days long? It's 30. 30, 30 days? 20, 29 days. 29 days long. Okay. And it's also a month for giving, for yeah. giving the poor, feeding poor. Ah. You cut um, animals yeah. and then you distribute it um, mm -hmm. to people on the streets to. Facilities and you, if not like you just give money, like if you can't like cut a sheep or something, you mm -hmm. just um, give money to people who are in need. So it's more like because like, they are part of God's creation, so right. you have to take yeah. care of God's right. creation. It's more like putting yourself when you're fasting, you are actually. I don't know the right terminology in English, but I'll say upgrade yourself by um, understanding poor, understanding people who don't have food. Self-improvement through empathy for right. others. Yeah, to like right. to feel yeah. what those people are suff yeah. suffering from, so you be thankful for what for yeah. yeah. God's yeah. happening. Also, yeah. it's a time when I say, you know what, whatever my weaknesses are, I'm sorry. Please mm -hmm. forgive me. Yeah. All, my, all my weaknesses from the, this course, all semester long, and actually, oh, since last Ramadan and now, I I ask your forgiveness. So it's a time of humility, yeah. right? Yeah. I think the fifth one is actually zakah. Zakah. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's not it's not that it has to do with Ramadan. It's an, its own thing. Everyone has to do it after Ramadan. Like give money to the. Uh, Am I spelling it right? Zakah, yeah. Yeah. Zakah. Yeah. Zakah. Yeah. And so that's, uh, that's like giving like, to others. Giving to others. Sharing. Yeah. So wow, there's a social obligation in Islam to take care of everyone. What if the poor people around you are not Muslims? Do you still take care of them? Yeah. yeah. So everyone really? in, the, in the city. But they're infidels. Mm -hmm. what, what you mean? <laughs> they're they're not Muslims. Do we care about non-Muslims? Yeah, but if they're still like gift from God. Like they're still part of God's creation. Part of God's creation. Yeah. So wow. Yep. Yeah. Pretty generous. Mm -hmm. That's not what I see in the action movies about Islam. Totally different. And the same as Christianity and Judaism, they're not expressed the right way in action <laughs> movies, do right? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Wait, we can't do that. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, So the city as an organism, the last three lectures of the course uh, used to be the first three lectures of the course. And these are the same themes as the version of the course that I took when I was in architecture school. It starts with the city as a cosmos, the city as a machine, and the city as an organism. And so these are three distinct models of how cities operate. And you notice we're, we're talking about what cities do. They are instruments of achieving specific outcomes. When I was going to architecture school uh, in the 80s, in the last millennium, um, 
architecture didn't do anything. It was out of bounds for us to talk about what architecture does. Architecture is just beautiful form. We're not supposed to talk about what architecture does. Well, that's part of what caused the problems that we're facing in the 21st century. And so um, many of us who were educated in the last millennium are here to say, we got it wrong. And we're doing the opposite of what we were taught. So now, if you've noticed, throughout the history and theory of architecture courses, and now in this course, all we talk about is what architecture does and how architecture does what it does. And in this course, we talk about what architecture and urban form does and how architecture and urban form does what it does. That's where the meaning comes from. Back in the dark ages when I was educated, it was all about the metaphors of architecture. Everything was symbolic, everything was metaphorical, everything was a diagram. Uh, architecture was not an instrument for actually doing anything. It was just a metaphor or a symbol of meanings that people might have access to, they might not have access to, it doesn't matter as long as architects can talk to each other about it. That's kind of pathetic and embarrassing now to admit, but we're, we've moved on and now the only thing we care about is what architecture does and how it does it. For those of you who are going on to the thesis program, that is the basis for every conversation, every presentation. What is the situation that your project is in? Given the situation your project is placed in, what must it do and how does it do it? And so, in a way, what I'm admitting to here is that I have been very selfishly preparing you not just for a successful career, but for a successful shot at doing uh, a powerful thesis in the master's program. So, um, this continues uh, in these last three lectures, where the organism is all about complexity. That sometimes things that look like absolute chaos are anything but chaotic. And then there's um, the machine. It's about uh, the rapid reprodu reproduction of systems. And the cosmos, now we're down to kind of symbolic operations. But it's the most basic of them all. And when, after, in the aftermath of this course, what we hope uh, the impact of this course will be will, is that you will go out in the world and you will look at the world and you will see things differently than you uh, did before you took this course. When you look at extreme complexity in the fabric of the city, you, uh, you look at it with uh, greater intensity. You don't dismiss it as being chaotic. You look at it um, trying to decode the complexity. For example, extreme complexity um, similar to what we looked at in the informal cities. So there's a very strong connection between this topic and the informal settlements uh, topic that we got way back in January. Remember that? Ancient mm -hmm. history? Mm -hmm. So when, we, when you encounter the informal city, let's say for example, I don't know, um, just pulling something out of the air, Caracas, Venezuela, you should, this, the intention of this lecture is to empower you to engage the informal settlements of places like Caracas and identify a logic uh, that, uh, and set of forces that are the explanatory DNA of this pattern. This is not chaos. This is a very strict pattern that comes to us um, uh, in a way that as soon as you decode it, you can start to see the rules underlying these forms. 
there are forces that underline forms. And if architects do anything at all, it is the translation back and forth between forces and forms. We identify forces and we produce forms out of those forces. We look at forms and we trace them back to the forces that are driving those formations. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that ring a bell? And so this reading is a, an extreme example of the laws of Sharia uh, and the requirements and expectations of Islam and the practices, especially when it comes to privacy, is a really interesting set of forces that are not totally unrelated to what all humans experience in terms of publicness and privateness. Uh, and um, a set of rules and practices and expectations that are the forces underlying complexity of form. So, um, Islam, 7th century, it started in a, on the Arabian Peninsula and uh, spread throughout the world very quickly, including Spain, from the 8th century to the 15th century, from, from 700 something to uh, Christopher Columbus. This was an important center of Islam. That's why if, when you pick up your Spanish dictionary, do you see how fat the A section is? Do you see that? It's huge. That's because something like 30 or 40 percent of the words in Spanish are from Arabic. Yeah. All this and all that. Um, who speaks Spanish? Yeah. Oh, you want me to say a word? No, go ahead. What, what did you want to contribute? Oh, no, I just had Yeah, words. Do you have words? Oh, my. <laughs> Azuka. Azuka. Yeah, so, um, yeah. What do you guys think? Do you see any rules at work here? If you were going to reverse engineer the rules that generated this form, <coughs> what would the rules be? Well, the houses seem to be the same size, or roughly the same size. Roughly the same size and the same height. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the kind of says that uh, I guess there were some rules based on the total reading I did, but it was only, it was like selected, it was very select who had the thing um, to make some of the rules, or at least the, some, some of them seemed very, seemed very general to me, but <coughs> they didn't get down to any of the oh, this house needs to be different, this one. This house, this, what? Like, this house needs to be different based on who lives there, or, um, like, oh, this, I mean, this seems to say this house has to be the same as this house has to be the same as this house has to be the same yeah. as this house. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like they didn't get um, that specific. Well, also, what did they say about uh, the heights of houses? Who read that part? Is it okay <laughs> if my house overlooks your house? No, why not? Because of the privacy. 
it's privacy, right? This house, I, I live in this house and I want, I'm, I'm rich. I, my uncle uh, sent me money from the US. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows money grows on trees in the US and I'm rich now. I want to add another floor to my house. Can I do that? No. Why not? Privacy. House, my house is not allowed to look down on your house because in this climate, we sleep on the roofs and privacy, right? Yeah. Wasn't it also respect too? What is it? Uh, like a factor of respect. Respect, yeah. And also, I don't want to flash my wealth. That's, that's, um, that's not polite, right? So I have to have humility in the society um, it's not about my wealth, it's about whether I'm a good person. And a lot of being a good person it has to do with following these expectations of behavior and treatment of others. Now one thing we know that is a difficult thing to decode here is that in this house, um, do I have to go through my neighbor's house in order to go to the market? Um, no. No. How do I know that? It looks like I do. It looks like I'm trapped in here. Yeah, so somehow, somehow there is a circulation system yeah. that leads to every house. So every house has its own private entrance. So that's one of the puzzles that this particular arrangement um, poses for us. It's very difficult to make legible the circulation system. Like we start to see things here, um, that's a circulation system, but it's really difficult to imagine how we get to some of these inner, these landlocked houses. It's not easy. If this is one of the puzzle, like, I don't know if this makes for a good analysis. But there are rules throughout. I have a question. So do you know where this place is? I don't. A lot of these slides came from my colleague Ali Koder uh, from Beirut. Uh, Lebanon, who co-taught the course with me a few years ago, and um, sorry, he's he's an expert on these things. I don't know where he got this picture. So the history, is, okay, six thirty-four. It started in Mecca and Medina, the cities of the Prophet and then spread very rapidly throughout the world. And um, the first thing that Islam had to do, it had to take all these separate uh, peoples and distinct cultures and distinct languages and distinct practices and distinct uh, almost tribal identities, and it had to unify them. So the first thing that to realize about Islam is that it is one of the most cosmopolitan religions. It's a cosmopolitan system. It never depended on uh, imposing a cultural system. It was a religious system that embraced whatever local cultures and practices uh, existed. And at the center, when we pray five times a day, we face the Kaaba in Mecca. Where is that? Do you have the app? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, before I pray five times a day, I have to figure out right there? Yep. Okay. So Mecca is right there. So I have to face Mecca and then perform my prayers, mm -hmm. right? So if you go into hotel rooms, you see a green arrow on one corner in the ceiling that tells you which way to face. If just, you know, before there was an app, there were the arrows. But one of the things that we uh, referred to two weeks ago was the fact that Christopher Columbus 
was pretty ignorant about the geography of the world. He thought that he was going to get to the Spice Islands by sailing uh, due west um, for a couple of days. Well, not only did he not hit the Spice Islands, he miscalculated the size of the planet by many multiples. He should have had a Muslim geographer on his ship because Islam had, at that point had um, mapped the stars in the sky through the very sophisticated scientific instruments of astronomy. They had the most advanced scientific understanding of the world. They had the mathematical, uh, they knew about uh, the sphere of the earth. They knew how big it was. They knew where everything was, in part because they had to figure out where Mecca is at all times. No matter where they go in the world, they have to know where Mecca is. And so they had to figure out. That was the, the thing that created such sophisticated geography and mathematics. Have you ever heard of algebra? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of Arabic numerals? You know, so these things are the great gifts uh, of scientific understanding that came from uh, the, the great centers of thinking uh, of Islam. Have you heard of Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato? If not for the great libraries of the Islamic world, like in Cairo and Alexandria, and um, Damascus and, uh, and in Spain, if it weren't for these Islamic centers of scholarship learning uh, the great collections, we would have no idea that the Greek philosophers ever existed uh, because they were preserved in these library collections and that's the only way they came to us in the modern time is through those things. So. Kaaba in Mecca uh, at the center. And if I, am, if I have the means as a Muslim, I am obligated at least once in my lifetime to perform Hajj, is to go to Mecca during the month of Ramadan, circumambulate the, the Kaaba, and uh, fulfill my obligations as a Muslim. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's not only this in the mosque. It's what? It's not only this. It's not like only circulating around the cloud, but there's, there's a, a bunch of stuff. Yeah, there's somehow process for this. It's not yeah. only going it's, on. Yeah, it's, yeah. It has its own, it, its own month, so it's not, it's not Ramadan. Oh, it's not months. Ramadan? No, it's not Ramadan. It's two weeks after Ramadan? Two months after Ramadan. Two months after two Ramadan. Ramadan. Almost 60 days after Ramadan. And okay. it's also like, also we use this story thing for, to, to decide, like, to know if Ramadan is 30, 28, 29 days. Right. So there's a lot of study of yeah, uh, astronomy yep. because it's a lunar calendar. Yeah. So when's Ramadan this year? It should be like 24th of April. 24th of April? Yep. So it shifts it's nine or ten days every year in relationship yeah. to the, the Gregorian oh, calendar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of science goes into making sure this is all synchronized with the lunar patterns. Yeah. Uh, Dome of the Rock. Um, what's the story here? What happened here? You got to be able to yeah, right, right. take a huge story that you spent your whole life learning and like, like ask me about Easter. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus was crucified and died on the cross. Three days later, he rose again and uh, died for our sins, uh, opening us up to eternal life. One sentence. Boom. Right? Thank you to my mother. I want to thank my mother for teaching me this. She was a catechism teacher. So you, do you have a one-sentence version of the Dome of the Rock? No. This is where Muhammad ascended the to heaven. No. I don't know what the... Uh, Isn't this explain. where he went, he got the... He was given... The, the, the Islamic thing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Pray five times a day. Yep. This is, this is the point where he connected with the girl. With he, it's, not, it's not... Yeah, but it's like an iconic place. It's an iconic the, place. Yeah. Right. You can say that, but it's not only the, the one 
the, the only place that he got this. Coincidentally, also crucifixion of Jesus. Yep. Very Jerusalem close. Jerusalem too. Yeah. Yeah. This this point in the earth is like known as the earth of religion. Like yeah. I mean like the land of religion. Yeah. Three religions in this uh, point. Yeah. were really created on this one location. I, I forgot the story to be honest, but I think there was uh, other prophets with them, not just him. It might be Jesus. I'm not sure. I'm yeah. So Judaism, this is also the site of uh, King Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. The first and the second temple were here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot going on in this site. Total chaos, or is it? No. Thank you. So the courtyard house, uh, you don't see anything from the outside. You see a door. And uh, you open the door and you enter into a space that is for uh, guests, but they can't see in deep into the house. Uh, it's screened because of privacy. Uh, we need to respect the privacy of others. And then, but if you're part of the family, you come into the courtyard, and if you're a male, uh, you dominate the ground plane where there might be the possibility of engagement with outsiders. If you're female, you go upstairs. And uh, to the extent that you can see out uh, of the second floor at all, it's a screened area so that you can see out, but people can't see you. People can't see in. So it's like there's a translation from the clothing, the veil uh, of women, the veiling of women, and the house, the architecture, is an extension of the veiling of women to the veiling of the house. So privacy, uh, where uh, the women on the second floor can see out, air can flow through, but uh, the outsiders cannot see in. So there's an architecture uh, analogy that operates like a veil. Is this in Iraq? I'm not sure where this is, but this is a shopping street. See that shopping street? I, I believe in the, that this is in Iraq. Where in Iraq is this? I don't know where exactly in Iraq, but this is, I think that this is in Iraq. But it looks Iraqi, do you? Yeah, because like Iraq, basically like their history and architecture, they are were, were well known with the courtyard houses especially. Yeah. And like they have a big market uh, areas and like they were well known with market thing and, yeah. and trading, so I believe that. So it's a covered market, it's a covered street. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a market street and we'll see some of that. Mm -hmm. So um, this whole thing, the, the city as an organism, it has to do, it, it, re it should relate, resonate very strongly with those of us who are struggling to comprehend the system of nature. Like how does nature work? How do biological systems work? How do ecosystems work? There are patterns in nature that, that seem to uh, dominate without intelligence. The, the DNA produces certain forms in nature, coral reefs, uh, biological systems, the complexity of nature. And uh, uh, one of the things that keeps coming up in design reviews is students say, um, there's my building and then there's nature. And, and often what students mean by nature is the, the lawn around the house. Is that nature? No, it's totally man-made. It is a man-made landscape. It is designed, it is built, it is part of the architecture. Even though there is a, a, a natural system involved, it is actually growing. Grass grows, flowers grow, trees grow. You know the artist who made this? Andy Goldsworth. You know him? Yeah, I had to study him in art class. Oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> so what's going on here? <clears throat> so this, in a way, is how we as architects should engage natural forces. Notice I didn't say natural world. Notice I didn't say nature. Where is nature? Where? Name a natural place. Yellowstone. Yellowstone, the jungle, Maine. Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. 
natural places, stuff. right? Untouched by human hands. It's natural. Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro. Untouched by human hands. Mars. Mount Rushmore. No. Mount Rushmore. Human hands. Human hand has never touched Mars. Yeah, that was true. <laughs> we we no sent robots. robots. We didn't send like our physical like like a physical hand is not touching Mars. Has Mars been impacted by humans? It has. Yes. It has. Yeah, yeah. We've, been, we've, been, we've, been, we've been shooting robots up there for the past few decades. <laughs> and the human hands, well, indirectly, human hands right. produced yeah, robots, we, robots. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> you know, if we shot they our... Want us to let's, let's say we took, you know, say, oh, landfills are full, and so Chart Wells put all your garbage from lunch on a rocket ship and sent it to Mars. The landfills are full, so Chart Wells starts why we serving us stuff from the landfills. Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> they, yeah. So, yeah, so... They're already doing it. So we... Uh, the, the general consensus view on nature is that there are natural forces all around us. There are uh, wild things growing. But on this earth, and in many places off this earth, the day when you could say with confidence that there is any place that is untouched by humans, that ship has sailed. There is not a single place on this planet that is not altered by human presence. Not Kilimanjaro, not Europa. this point of the ocean. Europa, we haven't sent anything to Europa. We did not yet. What about the Earth's, Earth's core? That's what you like to think. What about the Earth's core? Um, well, we kind of are killing the Earth. So we kind of well, if we dig any deeper, we'll reach the, 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 the hidden city in the center. center. How about if the, the the bottom of the Marianas Trench? How about that? Yeah, there's American actually a lot of documentaries that have edge. shown that even at the deepest point of our ocean, it's covered in trash. <laughs> the deepest oh, uh, oh, oh man! Like the deepest I need point a, they've ever reached is just covered in trash. I need a sick day now. I need a week off. So yeah, the microplastic content of the oceans is exploding. So there are plastics everywhere in the, throughout the oceans. The atmospheres, the oceans. I don't know about the core. You got me there. Maybe the core is still untouched. But it's temporary. It's a temporary condition. But when you stand up and present your projects, please, don't call it a road. Call it a street. You took this course and we want to see that it had an impact. It's not a road, it's a street. And there's no nature. There are natural forces, there are natural systems, but there is no place that is natural. All places are part of the built environment at this point. Sorry about that. And so acknowledging that the entire surface of this planet any place an architect will engage has already been altered by human forces. What then must we do? Are we responsible for the altering of these natural places? And if so, what's the right thing to do? Should we step back and let nature take its course? Or should we engage deliberately and with intelligence, understand the complexity and working with those natural forces, design uh, an intervention, a future intervention. That, so I'm, that's why I'm putting Andy Goldsworthy up. He sits there in the quiet and he contemplates the forces of nature and through the understanding, the probing of complexity, he is able to engage the natural world on its own terms. This is a profoundly architectural uh, intervention that 
emerges out of a possibility of understanding natural forces and working with those natural forces. The prerequisite for engaging effectively in the world in this way is to probe and understand complexity with humility and uh, with a childlike curiosity. What is going on here? What is the deal? What is up with that? He figures it out, and from that understanding, after days, hours, days, weeks, years of contemplating the possibilities, he engages, and uh, the product is something that is a combination creation between the natural forces and human intervention. It's not about being the genius designer in the tradition of Corbusier. It is about being a sensitive uh, scientist uh, with the curiosity of a child. Andy Goldsworthy is the right model for architectural practice in the 21st century, not Corbusier. Remember, at the moment Corbusier died, the human population was three billion. When Corbusier did his most important work, the population of the Earth was two billion. Why is he the role model for architectural practice at a moment as we approach eight, nine, 10, 11 billion humans? Corbusier has more to do with the designers of the Great Pyramids in Egypt than he does with us. So when your studio professor says, Corbusier, why don't you do what Corbusier did? Take it with a grain of salt. We are in a different world. You are stepping into a different river than the river that Corbusier uh, stepped into. Mm -hmm. So complexity uh, operates according to certain rules, and we are starting to understand those rules and model them with computers. Computer scientists have started to model through algorithms swarm behaviors. Uh, and so bringing us back to Islam, we have David Macaulay. Do you, who knows David Macaulay? Did you grow up with David Macaulay books? No, no one. Ah, okay. He was an architecture graduate of Rhode Island School of Design, and he went on to uh, write uh, several dozen books, illustrate books that we think of as children's books, but are actually extremely powerful um, diagrams of complex human systems such as the Islamic city. And so he has a book called The Mosque, and in it he's able to illustrate for us uh, something, uh, it's beyond the laws and rules uh, that we read about in the reading, but there are actual important components of the Islamic urban structure that um, you can see when you look at examples of Islamic cities. You can see the mosque. You can see the mosque turned to face Mecca. This is the Mirha, uh, and the, uh, the faithful uh, face the Mirab and face Mecca, and at the same time, often in many cultures, there are the cemeteries of respected uh, people that came before. So you are simultaneously facing Mecca, facing the the Imam, facing uh, the the revered uh, local saints and and holy people of the local culture. Is that did did you? get that growing up? It's actually like we don't like uh, thinking about uh, like important people because... Uh, On the equal, right. Yeah, because yeah. we, we actually, it's actually kind of taboo to... Yeah, it's kind of taboo. To think about that. Um, and maybe I'm under influence. Uh, and also it's very different from country to country. It's very different from country to country, yeah. Um, and so we have the mosque. Uh, we have... Uh, the different elements and we're going to going back in time we're going to see uh, that this architectural arrangement 
is very much an outgrowth of Roman architecture. Well, you already had the history of architecture one, where you studied Roman arch and vault systems. And uh, so you recognize this as a, a stone construction technology that uh, builds on top of what the Romans established. Um, the production of bricks, like that. Um, so there's the mosque, which has a, a mirab, uh, a domed space, and a courtyard in front. It's turned um, Qiblat to face Mecca. And uh, there is a madrasa school for uh, young men and women. Uh, and uh, we're not going to get into all the components, but there, are, there is a market place that is part of it. So this is very much a tradition that comes out of uh, Turkey. Mm -hmm. that um, is one of the many cultures. Um, but basically, it's important to understand, back to this idea of the cosmopolitan nature of Islam. When, as in Islam sweeps across between Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, across um, uh, through Asia, all the way to Southeast Asia, all along the way, there are traditions, uh, local building traditions and local uh, traditions, cultural traditions of life that are uh, all Islamicized. They're the Islamification of these local traditions. So there are changes, but basically the raw material of these local cultures uh, are embraced, adapted, and altered to become the quintessential uh, cultural formations, including the architecture, or especially the architecture, of Islam. And so we go to, I think we're in Isfahan at this point. Um, I also want to refer to a tradition of drawing um, that uh, I'm a huge fan of an architect from Boston who ended up teaching at Columbia University in the 70s. And he took students to various cities. Uh, and uh, they produced this remarkable set of drawings that are very much out of the tradition of the Noli map. Remember the Noli map? It's a f basically a figure ground drawing. But there's greater detail where there is public realm inside of the buildings. So where things are blank or black, that means it's private. We don't know what's in there. We're not supposed to know what's in there. But where we see the poche of the building and have access to the plan of these buildings, uh, these are public places. And so we have uh, madrasas, we have markets, we have mosques. And we have basically the public infrastructure that is all part of the uh, infrastructure of Islam. Islam is a fundamentally urban religion. Uh, in order to be um, a successful Muslim, the belief is that you need to be surrounded by a community of other Muslims. Uh, when I was working in Banda Aceh in the wake of the tsunami, uh, in 2005, um, working in villages with a 15% survival rate, we needed to relocate the families so that they were not uh, in the old locations spread out across the landscape with nobody in between them. We had to uh, reparcelize the villages and move the families next to the mosque because the practices of Islam in Banda Aceh were such that it was not cool to live out on your own as if you're in suburban Boston. You have to live with neighbors uh, because it's the community of the faithful that helps me be, be a, faith, uh, a, a, a successful Muslim. 
I need people around me to support my uh, daily practices. Um, and that's how I make sure, it's basically friends don't let friends, right? I didn't realize, I didn't make this connection before, but maybe that all comes from Islam. Um, friends don't let friends live far away from their friends because, uh, you know, I'm gonna, you know, my alarm goes off, I hear the call to prayer, I'm supposed to go to class, I'm supposed to pray, um, nah, I'm kind of tired, I'm just gonna blow it off today. It's like, no, wake up, go to class, pray, right? Same, same idea. So, the urban form is the infrastructure of successful Islamic practice. You need the community, uh, you need your friends. It takes a village to be a successful Muslim. And so the architectural infrastructure of Islam is all about uh, the rules and the practices of what it takes to be a successful Muslim and a successful human uh, living in a society that where people take care of each other. It's not about this rugged individual mythology where um, uh, it's all about uh, the success and failure of each one person at a time autonomous from all the other people. No, you guys are in this together. Um, when someone does, uh, whoever, if, so, if one person fails this course, I'm gonna drop everybody's grade uh, 10%. If two people fail this course, I'm gonna drop everybody's grade 15%, etc. cetera. If, like that would be a very uh, Muslim system where people are responsible for each other, right? I'm not gonna do that, but maybe next year. Should I do that? No. Okay. Okay. No fair warning. Next year. <coughs> but amazing drawings. And these these houses, these courtyard houses. Uh, the really interesting thing for us as architects is to understand the courtyard house. We used to have, in sophomore year, we used to do a courtyard house in Cairo. That used to be a standard uh, project. Oh, um, yeah, I heard about that. Have you heard about that? Yeah. It's Rami? been a while. Like, was this like related to Rami? No, it was pre Rami. Pre Rami? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. You guys know Rami? No. Okay. So, um, so in the houses you grew up in, in suburban New England, right, the wind, there, right, what am I going to say? So if here's the law, and for most of your practicing life in North America, when you are working on a single family house, there is, and I'm going to deliberately say road because I'm referring to the suburban situation. If any person has ever walked along this road, then it becomes a street. But since people don't walk in suburbia, it's still a road. So there's the road. There's a front yard setback of 35 feet. There's the rear, or maybe that's the rear setback. You know, maybe this is 20 feet. And then there's the side yard setback of 15 feet. So, so basically, the zoning controls guarantee that the house is an object building floating in the center of this mythological <laughs> nature. It's a symbol of nature. It's lawn and shrubbery. Uh, it's not nature, it's, it's what's left of nature after you destroy uh, nature. This, the courtyard house is the opposite. You, the center is not the solid, the center is the void. And so you end up with the exact opposite arrangement. So, um, and then on this side of the wall, 
There's a, your neighbor's house on, on all sides. And so there are no windows. Here, it's all windows facing all four directions. And here, there's no windows facing out. All windows face in to the courtyard. The benefit of this is, again, privacy. When I look out my window in a courtyard house, the only people I'm ever going to see are other people in my household. When I look out my window in the suburban house where I grew up, I see my neighbors. Not cool if you're a Muslim, right? So the courtyard house is the negative, the opposite of the object house. Yeah, I think like some of these houses have like windows that's facing outside. But we'll get to that. The, okay. They have like those cheap and um, like the mushrobia thing. The mushrobia. So that gives the privacy. Right. So especially in the upper levels. Yeah. If there is a, a street out here, then uh, you can see out, but people cannot see in. Yeah. Right. And even if someone across the street has a mushrobia, you can't. It's the architecture is such that you they can see out, but they can't see in here, and these people cannot see in here, right? Yes. Yeah. So, laws of Islam and the patterns of cities, and so. Uh, when you when encountering a city of this kind you see the courtyard houses and you can see this from Google Maps you can see the fabric of courtyard houses you can see this the main circulation paths um, and then you can see the institutions of uh, of Islam at the center <coughs> of the community yeah. because they have larger courtyards and often they are skewed uh, to face the Kaaba, the Qibla, and Mecca. See that pattern? Yeah. So what do you think about the pattern itself of the residential buildings? Like why is it's like so narrow between each other and it's not? Well, first of all, um, when we built this, the car had not yet been invented. Yeah, but why didn't like they have like somehow wide streets other like than those so narrow? Yeah, what do you guys think? Why are the streets so narrow? Does the reading give you a hint? The seven arms. I think um, that, that, that's something that I heard for the first time, but basically there was a width of the street that the Sharia uh, tells you that you need, you need, you need to be. Basically, the, the zoning to... code, the zoning code of Sharia. Did you? Did you? Nothing? No? Okay. Yeah, but also, like, other than this, this time, just, I mean, like, what kind of urban or environmental like impact that this can have those narrow streets. You know what I mean? It's like so we have those informal settlements. They mm -hmm. also have like those narrow streets. Right. Mm -hmm. But what's different here, I do think like I do believe that these most of these Islamic uh, uh, patterns were were built like in the Middle East where it's somehow the weather is much more like hotter than here right so this would somehow give like more shade in the streets which gives the people uh, the ability to walk inside the streets more right and so and environmental wind, yeah and move the wind inside those streets much mm -hmm. more easier and yeah so en environmental comfort is a factor yeah shading mm -hmm. <coughs> So um, I want to get to, but amazing drawings. Uh, and the Market Street. So um, this is a, a very intense, like the, 
The architectural form itself is so difficult to capture with conventional drawing that you basically have to invent a new way of drawing in order to capture this architecture. Uh, and you have to treat the urban form as if it were a building. Even though these are separate constructions, they follow a set of laws and rules and expectations and, and codes and cultural codes uh, and practices that the master builders would build this one, then they'd build this one, then they'd renovate this one, and then they'd build this one, and then they'd renovate this one. So it kind of evolves according to a similar set of rules and expectations uh, over time uh, following a, a, a fairly homogeneous and uniform set of expectations and codes. It's kind of like platform frame construction here in the United States. Who's, who's, done, who's framed a house? So what can you tell us about uh, platform framing in this context? How far apart are studs spaced? 16 inches on center. 16 inches on center. Did the architect tell you that when you were framing the house? There wasn't an architect involved. There was no architect. How do you build a house without an architect? Did the engineer tell you 16 inches on center? There wasn't an engineer. There wasn't an engineer. How did you do anything? What, Olivia? You just make it up as you go. You just make it up as you go, right? But. Who, who put their studs 16 inches uh, apart on center? What did you do? I did eight. Eight inches on center? Yeah. Basically, everyone did it 16 inches on center. Or in the bathroom where you need to put the plywood to hang the, the, the handicap bar, you might you might do something else. You might do special framing to support special features. But basically, there are codes and practices of platform frame construction that allows any, almost any building form, any house form, the uh, rules of thumb of platform frame construction allows you to do almost anything but no matter what, when you're, who's ever hung a picture on the wall? Right, so uh, do you use a stud finder? And once you find a stud finder, uh, once you use a stud finder, you find one stud, you know where the next stud over is, right? How far away is it? Well, actually, that's not true for my apartment. My brother and I, we were um, trying to like, put a TV. On Sherman Street? Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> and um, we ended up like drilling the whole wall, and there were like there wasn't any stud at all. And then we went out and like we thought we were bad at this, and then we went out and cut bought a stud finder. And one side had no stud at all, and the other side was like I think the house is like old, but they built on it somehow. They yeah. Did something. So like everything got so mixed up. I believe it. Sherman Street is a weird place. <laughs> I did I did some yeah. construction on Sherman Street and it's wacky. Yeah. Because it's some of these houses are from 1780s. Right. Like it's so interesting. And yeah. We ended up like drilling, drilling the whole wall. Yeah, I can picture it. But mm -hmm. since uh, since 1873 and in a lot of places before that, 16 inches on center with with almost absolute certainty, right? So there, so that's almost, for those of you who are familiar with platform frame construction, for those of you who might someday work on a project that is uh, a wood house, you know, either the construction from scratch or additions, remodeling of uh, single family houses in the United States, this is almost like an Islamic set of rules. It's a system. The platform frame construction system is a remarkable system. It is so elegant. It can do so many things. Um, I worked for years as a carpenter, and then I 
showed up in an architect's office. And the architect uh, was doing um, luxury house additions, kitchens larger than this classroom uh, in Palo Alto, in Silicon Valley in California. And I was horrified and shocked. Every time we came up with a design, he would call in an engineer. And the engineer would start saying, oh, you need a beam here, you need uh, this. He was, he was ignorant of the laws of uh, platform frame construction, and I found it very upsetting that he was ignoring the genius that is the system of platform frame construction. You will run into this too. Um, but it's a, it's a system, it's another one of these systems that permeates and makes it possible to, to build entire cities without a, f a professionally trained engineer without a professionally trained architect. So I want to show you, have you heard of Jeffrey Bawa in Sri Lanka? Um, Jeffrey Bawa's house in Sri Lanka, um, it's not a Muslim house, but he basically designed the house in an urban setting where every room faces a garden. And so this is the main, uh, the central space of the house. He built it over decades, uh, incrementally. But basically, the basic DNA is, uh, it's, it's a very much enclosed urban site in Colombo, Sri Lanka, that I had the great uh, fortune to visit. Um, but basically, it, it looks out onto gardens. Every room of the house looks onto either a large or small garden. Um, and that's, that's the DNA that makes up the house. And it's a very interesting arrangement of gardens and rooms. And this is one of his, this is the outcome, that there is a, a, a wall that uh, defines the urban plot. And then there is basically an outdoor room, a series of outdoor rooms. And so you alternate between indoor room, outdoor room, indoor room, outdoor room. And the courtyard house is very much of the same idea. You design the courtyard. The courtyard is the most important room of the house. And every other room of the house looks onto the courtyard and gets its value from the quality and uh, attributes and features of the design of that courtyard. It's kind of a meandering. This is more of a servant's access, but the main um, experience is through this garden into, there's a veranda here, and then through the center, and from that center you have access to the different rooms. Um, but here uh, you have multiple paths through to the more private area of the house back here. Um, and this is kind of the end point with uh, access onto uh, garden spaces throughout. Yeah. Kind of remind me of like those French architects, like I don't know, the they did something like that of mediating between the interior and the exterior. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And it has lessons for us here in the United States. Maybe the design of this space is important in and of itself. Maybe the design of this space is important in and of itself. Maybe the design of this space, maybe these spaces are the most important architectural design uh, features of our, of our work. It's an interesting uh, reversal of the usual conventional approach. Now, uh, going to Kuwait City in Kuwait, um, from high above, zooming in, 
to the block. I had a student who um, grew up in Kuwait City. This is this situation that Mo was referring to, where in an attempt to be modern, several cities uh, that grew up in the courtyard tradition Um, came under the influence of modern Western ideas and they started to pass codes that require uh, a space between houses. But um, in the context of Islam, what is the benefit of the space between those houses and what can you do with them? With, with privacy and things, like that gives like people privacy from each other. And it those, gives people privacy, like those. I mean, the the, the gap set back. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I don't know. It allows um, for small alleys to go between the houses. Mm -hmm. But you still, in order to maintain privacy, you still need uh, to really protect those walls. Oh, you're talking about the windows itself? Like yeah. The schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that in those places there is no windows in the sides in, mm -hmm. some, in some places and where they have windows. So back to the history, they treated this by the Mashabaya. Now the mm -hmm. codes are working on this or like people, architecture treating this by like differentiating the height of each level mm -hmm. so like you not like those windows are not facing each other by the side so they're not seeing each other you know what i mean but does that place one window above the other somehow like some now there are people like treating this in the architectural way this this is the modern way of very it. interesting yeah so maybe uh I don't know. So if like if those two windows are fa facing each other, so mm -hmm. people can go like th see through the next uh, residential place. Mm -hmm. But now if they like one is above the other, like it's there's no access vision mm -hmm. through those two windows. So you have to do two things. Like if I can press my face against the glass, I can probably look down. Yeah, but basically. But you do the screening thing, so I can't press my face yes. against the glass. It's my view. Mm -hmm. Using the mushrub, yeah, yeah, techniques. Like the, and also like the mushrubia thing, like where the w the way this went. So, in section, it's like a window, a normal mm -hmm. window, and there is like an, a wooden frame coming mm -hmm. outside. Right. So where it's extending out. Also, yeah, it's not open like as a normal window. That it just right. slides or something. Like it's right. It swings down. So if that's the wall. There's there's um, yeah something like this that uh -huh. keeps me from seeing this way and like the way so I can only see there yeah and if it's some yeah it's can, it can be open too but the way it opens like this wooden frame it opens mm -hmm. like this way in section so you okay. only can look down okay and no one like from your neighbors can look at you right so it's a it's a it's a really interesting problem where um, where uh, the westernization causes problems, mm -hmm. and uh, in some places I can't remember what city this is, but where they embraced these rules and they were in place for like six or eight years, and then they immediately abandoned them entirely, and you start to see this pattern um, all over where instead of each of these courtyards being associated with a single house, one of the really interesting building types uh, is the multifamily uh, dwelling, but with courtyards. It's a really, I don't know if you've ever worked on those. Yeah, I know. It's an interesting building type. We've had thesis projects in the past. Um, Mohammed bin Sahel, Sahal from uh, Jeddah was here several years ago and did a very interesting thesis project that was a multifamily dwelling uh, with a courtyard idea for Jeddah. And he's back in Jeddah working for the city uh, at this point, as far as I know. But some really interesting architectural uh, innovations uh, built on these ideas of privacy that students seem to really thrive on. So. There's so much else to look at 
um, but no time. So instead, what I'd like to do is to look at the term project. So remember that term project? Let's find that. In the last 10 minutes today, what I'd like to do is go over the term project. So you see on Blackboard, Okay, so uh, this is now available on Blackboard on a computer near you. Um, shouldn't this open? I'll give you a um, paper version of this uh, after spring break, but I want you to be aware. How does Blackboard work? I'm going to go to, there it is. That's nice. I'm not scared. Thank you. Um, so here's the term project. Um, so here, and here's the schedule of events. What I would like, so uh, you should have by now the term project Prezi. You should have access to the term project Prezi. Mm -hmm. Between now and next Monday, I hear a rumor you have the spring break. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That's correct. No. Um, so one of the things to stay active and uh, fresh during spring break is to start thinking about what images uh, you might want to analyze and uh, and we are trying to go back to and this is uh, something I want to discuss what if we focused back on the most significant challenges of your careers like what do you perceive as being the most significant challenges of your careers and uh, how can we support as a group the empowerment of you all as individuals and collectively to deal with those problems? Uh, and so that's basically the challenge that is being thrown before us uh, in, uh, and to be met through the mechanism of the term project. So what are the issues that matter most? What images, what urban fragments in the tradition of the analysis project that we do? Um, what evidence is most useful for us to look at to prepare ourselves to engage as architects uh, to address those problems? Uh, so the intention of the term project is that it is the same Thing that you've been doing all semester long. So by the time we actually uh, do this work of the term project, you will have each done or had the chance to do 11 sketch writings and 11 analyses and 11 uh, forum discussions using Prezi on Wednesdays. And so those, uh, the sketch writings are all worth 10 points. The analysis is all, is all worth uh, 20 points. 
Uh, but when we get to this one, those were all just practice. Now that some of you are just pinning the needle, I've never had a group with so many perfect 10 out of 10 scores, so many 19 or 20 close to perfect or perfect scores on the analysis. Congratulations and thank you for your hard work. Now is a chance to take that expertise and instead of 10 and 20 points, I think it's something like 60 and 120 or 30 and 60. It's worth serious points, this term project. Now that you've practiced, this is the one where you can score lots of points. For those of you who are distracted by the quest for getting good grades. Um, so that's, that's the intention of this assignment. Um, so between now and Monday, please go to the Prezi. It's numbered 00, zero Transformations, uh, called Transformations. It's the, it's the term project Prezi. Please upload uh, several images, images that you would like to consider as possible uh, bodies of visual evidence to look at. And instead of me giving you a reading for this term project, what reading do you think would be useful to sketch write about? And what I can do is offer you a bibliography of 100 or 200 readings that others have found useful in the past. Um, so I'll uh, share that via Blackboard as well. So in terms of this first step of images and readings, any questions from anybody? Yes, Dave. So we're all going to do the same reading? No. Um, and, what, and since we group, we often group, do you guys want to group together? Yeah. Sure. Because like, what if you find someone else's group? So um, let's do this. Between now and Monday, Oof. you can use Prezi. Now, between now and a week from Monday, use the Prezi as a platform for self-organization and collaboration.